Euh, merci, Greti. Je vais m'excuser parce que je ne vais pas parler en français aujourd'hui. Um, I'm going to switch in English because I'm a bit more comfortable, although I still have a very thick Italian accent, for which I apologize. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, presentation. Um, when I, when I, a couple of days ago, I had a look at the people attending, and I realized that the audience today is very heterogeneous, which poses a big um, difficulty, because it's very difficult to adjust uh, what I'm going to say. There are colleagues among you, and there are people who know a bit less about the brain, and they're here because today is the beginning of the Brain uh, Awareness Week. So I ask um, uh, to be forgiven if I'm going to be too simple or too complex. Um, and I also want to say that I would be really happy if you want to raise your hand and interrupt me in case there is something you don't understand or anything you want to ask um, clarification about. The story I'm going to tell you today um, is part of my um, research, what I've been done in the past 10, 15 years. And in those years, I tried, among other things, I tried to understand the functional meaning of the responses that we can record from the human brain when we give to healthy human volunteers sensory stimuli which produce painful sensations. This kind of uh, blobs, brain activity, we will see how it is really incorrect to assume that when you see a brain slice with a red blob, there is neural activity going on. This is very far away from the actual activity of uh, nerve cells. And I hope by giving this talk, I will also give some um, general ideas about um, biology, about why there is a brain. And the use and misuse of these techniques in uh, psychology and in cognitive neuroscience. So I hope to be um, forgiven if I start from something which maybe seems very obvious, um, but I think it's very important to understand what we're going to say later. So I'm trying to put things in a very wide uh, perspective, and I want to talk about some basic features of life. Um, this is a beautiful sentence from, the, um, from Valentino Breitenberg, who is the father of modern cybernetics, where he said, I live, I lived, and I want to keep living. I think it's a nice sentence to show the most fundamental feature of living beings, which is the fact that they try to preserve life across time. In a way, to live is to survive, and to survive is to live. So this is an unavoidable objective of living beings, trying to uh, maintain their life, it doesn't mean maintaining their own body because the body is altered, but the information about uh, life is maintained. And survival is so important and so pervasive in living beings because it's a necessary prerequisite to achieve what is really the duty of living beings, I would say the unavoidable objective, which is replication, replication and reproduction. And the reason why replication and reproduction is so important is because that reproduction produces, introduces some random variability in the offsprings, and that variability is where the very sheer force of natural selection acts and what causes the evolution of living beings. And of course, this is something which uh, cannot, we can't help uh, thinking about Darwin, about this, who showed for the first time that there is no design, there is no project, but uh, what we are, human beings and other animals, is just uh, the result of what Jacques Monod would call le hasard et la nécessité. And I want to uh, cite, I want you to read uh, a sentence by Jacques Monod, after remembering that these three things are really the core of life. And it's a beautiful sentence saying, chance alone is at the source of all creation in the biosphere, pure chance, free, there is no uh, kindness or of cruelty, there is just randomness, and this is at the root of the edifice of evolution. There is no scientific concept which is more destructive of this one, uh, of anthropocentrism than this one. It's a very, I think, uh, powerful sentence. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because it makes um, easier, I think, to understand why nervous systems and why brain uh, have evolved. How does all this relate to the brain? Relates to the brain because 
of the living beings having those features, some of them, those belonging to the animal kingdoms, are able to move widely in the environment. They move, they meet a changing environment, and this is why they need a, a device, a nervous system, which is able to sense the environment and to react to the environment in an appropriate way, in a useful way, to achieve those objectives. So we can say that animals have evolved the brain to cope with the world through perception and action, which are very much linked, to be able to react in a good way, in an appropriate way, to environmental stimuli with actions which are useful to survive and reproduce. So in a way, um, brains um, contain images of the world, um, what we perceive of the world is not the reality, is some models that our brains are, and these images or these models of the world are very much different across different species, and they're determined by these perceptual windows that we have on reality, which are quite species-specific, um, and these windows highlight those features of the world which are particularly relevant for behavior, and they're particularly relevant for the behavior not in general, but for that type of animal and that type and the ancestors of that animal. So we are very anthropocentered, anthropocentric. We talk about ultrasound and infrasound, but actually there are animals who can hear sounds which we label as uh, ultrasounds and so on. Vision, we are really sensitive to a very narrow band of um, the electromagnetic spectrum um, and so on. So that's very important to remember. And there is a beautiful sentence by um, Richard Dawkins really showing this, saying that hypothetical zoologists of the future should be able, just by looking at the brain, the nervous system of an animal that he doesn't know, uh, to reconstruct the statistical properties of the environment where the animal lived, to read what was common and what was rare in that animal environment. Because the main reasons a brain exists is to act as filters to highlight what is unexpected, what is uncommon, and to um, discard almost what is common and uh, predictable. So we can say that in the brain there is an innate knowledge of what in the environment is important, what is dangerous, what is um, necessary for a certain species, even before having experience of the world. Of course this knowledge is um, refined through life with experience, but the important concept is that through, throughout evolution, brains have been shaped to select environmental events on the basis of how relevant they are to behavior, keeping in mind those uh, important objectives of uh, life, survival and reproduction. And I think that if we keep this in mind, it's a bit less um, weird to state that what we know about the world is actually different from the world itself. Perception is different from reality. Um, so this is why what we perceive is not a faithful representation of the world. A typical example which is given in lecture is colors, which are not there in the world. It is the brain that adds color to objects. And the reason the brain does this is because it's much more useful to know that the apple is red against maybe a green background, regardless of the uh, light conditions, as opposed to knowing exactly the wavelength which is coming out bouncing of the apple. Um, another thing that the brain does very well is to enhance borders and contours. And in a way, if you think about this ability to enhance and detect edges, this is again a feature showing how the brain is well trained, well tuned to detect unexpectancy. Because here there is a discrepancy compared to there. And some very basic physiological features, mechanisms, like the mechanism of lateral inhibition across neurons, are the basis for this ability to identify unexpected uh, things. Um, of course, these unexpected things are very simple, but then progressively going up with the hierarchy, there can be much more complex. And to show this idea that what we perceive of the world is what is really useful, again, I'm going to uh, get the help of uh, an eminent physiologist from the US, Jerome Letvin, who said 
gave the typical example of the frog. The frog hunts on land by vision. The frog doesn't seem to see the details of stationary part of the world, but the frog will starve to death, even surrounded by food, if the food is not moving. So the choice of food is determined just by the size and by the movement. He will leap to capture any object the size of an insect or worm, provided it moves like one. It's really showing how there is an innate, innate knowledge of what is good in this case or dangerous about the world. Um, and this idea of um, perception being different from reality is what explains some visual illusions. Some of them are almost uh, beyond belief. Um, for example, that idea of lateral inhibition in enhancing edges and colors is what makes us to believe that the color of this B square is different from the color of the A square, while this is not the case. So if you remove the effect of the surrounding, you can see that A and B actually are of different color, but they're not perceived as such because it's very important and very useful to get a sense of contrast get a sense of where things are in the world, regardless of light. Um, so in a way, in the neuroanatomy of the brain, there is an innate knowledge of what is important in the environment. I think we have, get, we have understood uh, this concept. And this idea of um, lateral inhibition in neurons, this enhancement of edges, is very important because it allows us to get a sense of the shape of objects. There is a kind of rational knowledge of uh, uh, solid objects in the world. Um, this is very important to recognize things. And another nice example uh, of how neuroanatomy, you know that the brain uh, is usually, almost all brains have two hemispheres. There is a bilateral symmetry and they have some fibers connecting the same parts of the right and the left hemisphere. And these connections, which are called technically commissures, allow comparing things happening in corresponding parts of the hemispheres, allow to enhance something which has a bilateral symmetry. Is it important? Yes, it is very important because having a symmetry right-left is basically telling us when we are meeting an animal in the forest, for example, that that animal is coming towards us. It's a kind of basis of social interactions and I think it's not excessive to say that in the commissions of the visual system there is kind of basis for the relationship between ourselves and the others. So if we, keep about, if we think about this idea that the brain enhances what is unexpected with the aim of survival and reproduction, I think it's very easy to understand um, the meaning of those brain responses I was talking at the beginning. Because something very important, we have seen that a lot, is that we, the ability to identify and react correctly to sudden, transient, unexpected events in the world is very important to avoid, to avoid damage to the body. How does this relate to pain? It does very much because the reason why pain exists, the reason why it has been naturally selected, it's because it happens before there is an injury or before the injury becomes very serious. That was beautifully um, um, explained by uh, Pat Wall. And um, these models that the brain uses to detect threat, uh, what we are finding is that they follow a very precise set of hierarchical rules which are important to decide what event in the environment is likely to reflect something which is dangerous for survival and therefore which makes uh, reproduction uh, less possible. So, a small detour, uh, if you want to study pain, you need to, of course, have human volunteers, you need to have, like, a laboratory. And it's not easy to study pain without um, messing around with other sensory stimuli. And um, one of the um, objectives of people trying to study pain was to deliver a stimulus which is purely painful and is not uh, tactile, for example. Pinching the skin is not enough because you also activate tactile stimuli, the tactile afferents, you have tactile sensations. And um, there are some very nasty ways in which uh, nociceptive afferents have been um, uh, activated in the past. For example, by electrically stimulate the tooth pulp, which is only innervated by pain-related fibers, 
or by electrical stimulation of the human cornea. Uh, this was done in uh, people in jail in the US in the 70s. But it was a good news for the field that um, a bunch of biophysicists developed the technique of laser stimulation of the skin, the use of radiant heat to activate selectively A delta and C units, which are those nerve fibers detecting stimuli which are potentially noxious and dangerous for the body. And the reason why laser stimuli can do this is because they can heat the stick, the skin, this is a section of the skin, and activate only the most superficial parts of the skin where only pain-related fibers are located and touch-related fibers are not because they're much deeper. So if you come to my lab and you want to volunteer for an experiment, you get these stimuli and you will feel something which is a bit like putting the hand on a candle. So it's pure pain without any tactile uh, sensation. When you do this, there is a transient, fast-rising stimulus, which is clearly noxious. It does feel as painful. And the coding of that stimulus by the nervous system, how it is, where it is, how strong it is, is what is called nociception. So we activate, as we've seen, for example, in the hand, these peripheral fibers. And the nervous system is able to code um, the stimulus. And the information about the stimulus is transformed and transmitted from the spinal cord up to the brain, and then it reaches the cortex where it produces what? It produces a painful sensation. It's wrong to talk about a painful stimulus. We should talk about a noxious stimulus because pain being a conscious percept is something that arises only at the level of the, um, of the cortex, of the neocortex. So the outcome, for example, of a laser nociceptive stimulus, is certainly pain, but when uh, people uh, like us have been using those techniques like MRI or electrophysiology, sticking electrodes on the head of volunteers, to try to understand, to record this brain activity caused by stimuli uh, producing pain, they were really focusing on this perceptual outcome of the arrival of the stimulus, and they were kind of um, neglecting some other very important features of the response, which I think are very clear if we keep in mind what I said at the beginning about the um, obligations of living beings. And those are, for example, orienting your attention towards the stimulus, which has caused uh, the percept, some autonomic responses, for example, increase of blood flow, or change in the uh, diameter of the pupil, which are also behaviorally very useful, and more important, some motor responses or the lack of motor responses, because if you are in a lab and you're asked not to move, even if you get something which is perceived as painful. And I think forgetting about this has been a source of so many misconceptions in my field, because as you will see, the response in the brain is actually dominated by these other things and not by the activity of neurons causing the painful quality of the sensation uh, elicited by the stimulus. So the idea is that we give these laser stimuli, they produce pure pain. We can measure the activity of the human brain, in technical terms we say at population level, from large, very large group of neurons, for example by sticking electrodes on the head of a subject. And also, uh, because this neural activity is coupled with an increase of blood flow, if you have an MRI scanner, you can get some very distant and very indirect information about the neural activity that has caused this increase of blood flow, which is sensed by this MRI machine. What we record in the brain when there is a transient stimulus producing a painful percept is a big brain potential. It is a big, band, big uh, burst of electrical activity. And this thing, which is called the vertex potential, because it's maximal at the top of the head, has a symmetrical and central distribution on the scalp, is the largest synchronization of neural activity that we can record from the brain of a healthy human being. And we can get that when there is a stimulus which is very intense and very surprising. And believe it or not, there are neuroscientists here in the room. If you ask them, what is the meaning of this electrical response, which is called an evoked potential, they probably would give you different questions. And the truth is that we don't know yet what is the functional significance of that big vertex brain potential. Um, if you use MRI, you get um, quite consistently across labs 
an array of brain areas which are considered to be active, although this assumption that when you see an increase of MRI signal there is neural activity and that area is working is really um, dangerous because there are many things going on from neural activity and this very crude scale of uh, functional MRI, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And when these pictures, which do have a very remarkable power of suggestion, they kind of give a sense of understanding that there is something real in the brain, maybe because we are intrinsically dualists, and by looking at this, we, we, we kind of see that there is something biological. I think this also is something that has been fueled by newspapers and the magazines showing sloppy research results uh, about, I don't know, sex and pleasure or things like this, which attract attention, and still the science underneath is not really uh, the best one. So the first time this kind of techniques uh, were used to study pain, to identify this network of brain areas which are active when a person feels pain, this is one of the first papers, extremely highly cited, describing activity in those brain areas. And it's very interesting because these colleagues at that time, they said, oh, this activation in the brain, especially in this part of the brain which is called the cingulate cortex, is a surprisingly specific representation of pain. It's a very strong statement. It's really saying this is the correlate of a perceptual activity. Of course, um, uh, journalists said, oh, the pain center in the brain has been found because of that um, simplistic tendency of assigning a function when we see a brain blob. Um, but this idea actually got established because it is true that this, that was called at the beginning a pain matrix, it is true that if you look at the amplitude of that response, it does correlate with pain. So you put someone in a brain scanner or with electrode, you give a stimulus which is painful, you see a response, you see that the size of that response gets bigger when the subject tells you that there is more pain, so there is a good correlation. And people said, okay, that's a neural marker of pain. It must be related to the activity of neurons causing the percept. Well, it's not as simple as that. Uh, as often happens in science. It is certainly true that if you give a stimulus that goes up in temperature, you get more um, blood flow in those areas. If you do the same uh, using electrophysiology, recording electrical activity from the brain, stimuli reported to be more painful, P4, produce a response which is larger than stimuli reported as less painful, P1, so it's a good correlation. And on the basis of that correlation, the concept that these responses represent a cerebral signature for pain perception. Signature is an important word. We need to be careful with language because it really implies a one-to-one -one mapping. So it's something which is unique for that. Well, this kind of uh, concept got established. Um, and it is true um, that you can use those brain measures to predict pain. This has been... Uh, widely done, is becoming very, very fashionable, especially because now there are medical legal cases of people claiming that they have chronic pain because of an accident, they want to get uh, uh, compensation. So there are like companies being set up to use these measures as a demonstration that pain is real. And that's very dangerous because even if we can predict pain, the important thing we cannot forget is that we can do this maybe using some activities in the brain which, has not, which are not necessarily related to the quality itself. Um, this is just to show that this is really an important issue for society because in the US is becoming a big thing about this idea of having uh, measures of percept pain in particular to provide compensations. Um, but the problem is that this Belief is based on a correlation, but correlations are not necessarily causations. And still, there are implications, important ones, which derive from that understanding of a pain-specific interpretation. For example, people have been saying, if we see brain areas activated in someone in coma, then we need to treat that patient more aggressively. Or people have been using the similarity in the pattern of brain response. Remember the... Um, low spatial resolution of those techniques to make claims, for example, about the basis of empathy for pain. These studies, unfortunately, are simplistic 
um, to say the least, um, because they don't consider one thing. And the question I want to pose, I did pose myself, um, is this one, very simple. Are these brain responses which sometimes allow predicting the quality of uh, the intensity of a subjective percept, are they really specific for pain? And the answer is mostly they are not. They are not because they are something else. It's super interesting to try to understand what that something else is. It relates to those basic features of life, survival, I mentioned at the beginning. That's why I bothered you with that uh, general introduction. And I want to show you uh, how we came to that uh, conclusion, which, of course, opened new questions. Um, I said that this electrical activity of the brain, these very, very large vertex potentials or evoked potentials, correlates with the intensity of percept from one to four. It is true, but it is true if you give stimuli of different energies from low to high, and then you have a long interval variable between a stimulus and the next one. And your volunteer is asked to give you a single trial rating, a rating of each stimulus, a few seconds after the stimulus. Then wait, and then at some point the next stimulus will, uh, will arrive. So in science it's very important to try to find exceptions to rules. And here is an example of an exception to that rule. So if we give the same stimuli, again, of graded energy, but instead of giving them, let's say, 20 seconds apart in a kind of less predictable way, we start giving them in little trains of three stimuli, which are separated by a second, for example. We use three here. They could be five. They could be seven, and so on. The energy of the stimulus changes from train to train, from triplet, as, it, as we call it, to triplet. And then we ask the subject to tell us how intense the sensation caused by each stimulus of the train was. The stimuli are very transient and short-lasting. You do get a pinprick sensation, like, like a, a, the best ecological explanation of what you feel when you get these laser pulses on your hand. is a bit like when you're frying eggs and there is a droplet of oil falling on your head. It's a kind of pinprick, short-lasting sensation. So when you do this, uh, what you get is a psychophysical function in which you can see that the intensity of percept, uh, for example, from a 0 to 100 scale, is very much dependent on the energy of the stimulus, no surprise so far, and is not dependent on the fact that you repeated the stimulus. The three stimuli are uh, perceived as more or less equal intense. But then, when we look at what happens in the brain, the situation becomes complex and therefore interesting, the vertex wave elicited by the first stimulus of the train is the one that codes very well with what the subject tells you. But if we look at the brain response elicited by the second and the third stimuli, which are perceived in terms of intensity of the pain as painful as the first one, then you see that the response is very much reduced and loses the ability to predict perception. What's going on? is an exception to the rule. That idea that these are pain-evoked potentials cannot be entirely correct. There must be something else going on. Maybe we're dealing with something different. Um, this is another experiment, which we have done a while ago. It was very difficult to publish this one because it was very controversial. Um, very simple. This time we used MRI, that technique to get measures of blood flow, which are indirectly related to brain activity, a technique which is widely used. And people were in the scanner. I don't know if any of you has been uh, a subject for this experiment. It's quite, quite an experience. And they were getting on the foot the lasers, producing the sharp pain, a strong tactile, short-lasting vibration, a very loud auditory stimulus, bang, and a very bright visual stimulus, an array of LEDs. They were all mixed up. Um, the interval between the stimuli was very variable. And then, very simply, if you look at what happens in the brain of those subjects at group level, then this is what you get in response to stimuli, which are all very surprising, but perceptually they're very, very different. Certainly, a bang or a flash of light is very different from a pinprick pain on the dorsum of your foot. And this is what you get. So I don't know if there is anyone here who wants to try to guess 
which one of these is audition, pain, vision, and touch. Um, there is one which is very easy, I'm sure. Uh, vision, yes, well done, it's the green, because there is activity in the visual cortex. The others become a bit more difficult. I don't know if you will be able to, to say what is what. If you look carefully, you can solve the problem. For example, apologies for people who are not um, biologists, but if you look at these sagittal sections, you can see that the red and purple condition, they have a, a blob of activity here, um, but not the other two. And here is where the map of the body in the brain contains the representation of the food. So we can probably say that these two are things touching the body, are somatosensory stimuli. And this is actually the case, this is audition, but it's very difficult to decide what is touch and what is pain. And still, perceptually, they're all very different um, conditions. So if you do a kind of um, analysis, very simple, and you look at what is activated commonly, and you put that in yellow, you see that most of the brain responds in a similar way to these stimuli, which are still perceptually very different. Um, very recently, uh, we also uh, put in the scanner some very rare patients who are not able to feel pain. They have a condition called congenital analgesia. They can detect stimuli, which are noxious, but they are uh, not able to detect the painful quality of the percept. And very big shortcut. In those uh, patients, those are the brain activities you get um, in controlled subjects who are normal or red if you gather data from other studies investigating pain. And then you see that these pain-free patients in yellow, they basically produce activity in the same areas. Of course it's not the same, but largely it is uh, the same, in the same areas which are also um, responding to um, those stimuli in people who perceive pain. It's just another demonstration that that correlation is not really an obligatory one and we need to think more. I'm very much interested in uh, electrophysiology and this is that big synchronization of electrical activity in the brain. Even this vertex potential uh, is something that is not really specific for pain. If you use auditory tactile stimuli to produce it, most of it, especially the late part, is contributed by neural activity, which I like to call multimodal, that they are common to stimuli belonging to different modalities. Only the beginning of the response has some activity coming from electrodes above the primary sensory cortex, the area of the brain which receives first inputs from the body. But there is nothing clearly saying this is caused by something painful or not painful. So, if you think about all those conclusions, what was called the pain matrix, the pain center in the brain, the surprisingly specific representation of pain in the brain, is actually something you can get with stimuli which are not at all painful, provided that they are behaviorally important, salient, relevant. And that's why I bothered you at the beginning. So, if you keep this in mind, that you can get something which you do get in pain also when there is no pain, you see that the statement, oh, if we see those areas in someone, in a patient in coma, it means that that person is experiencing pain and we need to treat the patient in a more aggressive way, is probably not valid. And again, all the speculations about empathy in the brain and how it comes about are also probably not really very, very solid. Um, I'll show you something else, uh, which is a study, let's skip this, um, in which people have been looking at social pain. Pain has another problem, which I don't know if I will have time to talk about, which is the problem that the word pain is a very imprecise word, and we use it for many things. When I talk to people, people say, oh, but do you talk about like physical pain, emotional pain, social pain? So this kind of um, vagueness in language is a source of problems. This is a study where um, um, some colleagues put in an MRI scanners um, a population of students who just experienced a romantic breakup. They were left from girlfriend or boyfriend. And while in the scanner they gave them uh, two types of stimuli, they gave them um, 
physical pain on the dorsum of the hand with the thermal stimulus, and they also gave them short presentation of a photograph of the former husband or wife who left them. So we have two very different uh, stimuli, and they found, surprise, that the areas which were activated by the physical pain were also activated by social pain. And they used that similarity to say uh, that this overlap between social rejection and physical pain means that in the brain there is a common somatosensory representation for social pain and physical pain. This is a big statement, and if you think about what I showed you, the fact that you can get these responses, even with stimuli which are not painful, it really shows how we should be uh, more careful. There are also silly studies showing that, oh, just the idea of having to do maths is painful because in the brain there are the same regions activated by pain, and so on. But when you talk about this idea of social rejection, then things become dangerous because the idea that social exclusion is really physically hurtful, which is based on those so-called overlap results, then is driving clinical trials in which people start giving non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to uh, children who have been bullied at school. And maybe that is a good treatment. Uh, I don't want to go into that debate, but certainly the rationale for running those studies is not a good one, is a flawed one, because we are really talking about responses which are not very specific. This is another example in which um, these are the brain responses. Again, we know this by now by people who received stimuli perceived as painful. And try to guess what these are. These are responses from the brain of newborns. And there is a big debate in neonatology about like the need to treat or not um, newborns with analgesics because they often have side effects and problems. And these basically uh, colleagues, they found that the brain of an infant respond in a similar way to, what, to how the brain of an adult respond to pain. And they use that, again, maybe this is a bit of like uh, press releases, but they use that to say, oh, this means that babies bees do feel pain like adults. So these pain regions, they're not really pain regions because they're very gross estimates of activity of a population of neurons. It shows that infants are more sensitive, even more sensitive to pain than in adults, and more important, we need to review pain relief guidelines. Again, dangerous, we need to be careful about this kind of uh, statements. Why people are trapped into these things? Because there is a kind of um, tendency, and it would be very interesting to discuss why um, human beings have this tendency of finding causal relationships in the world, even when there aren't causal relationships in the world. Uh, to assume that when you see something in the brain is related to a perceptual state. It is certainly true that psychologists especially use functional neuroimaging, these techniques, to try to understand something about the mind, about the mental processes which are going on. And regardless of the problems in using these blood flow measures to get information about the neural activity, the idea of inferring a state perceptual state on the basis of brain activation is, from a logical point of view, absolutely uh, simply flawed. Because, you know, in logic, we can certainly say, if we run an experiment, if we, we know that if A, then B, then we run our experiment, our observation is A, we can certainly conclude B. There is no problem about this. But there is something very similar um, I mean, to put this in more friendly term, I usually I use this metaphor. I say, if John is doing laundry at home, he uses more electricity. I run my experiment, I observe that John is doing laundry, and then I can certainly conclude that he is using more electricity. Now, something very similar to this, but profoundly different from a logical point of view, a very much effective the interpretation of those results I was mentioning, is this. I know that when John does laundry, he pays a higher electricity bill. My experiment is showing that the electricity bill is increased at the end of the month. And then what I, I'm tempted to conclude is that, ah, he was doing laundry. That's why there is an increase of energy consumption. 
it's obvious that here there is a problem because it could be that this is an explanation but there are many other possible explanations for my uh, observation for example he was making a cake for his children so and this is something we need to keep in mind we can't really get away from this kind of reverse inferences in science but we need to treat them uh, with care in a probabilistic way we can't simply run an experiment with i don't know on voters for right wing or left wing parties and seeing that right wing parties have more activity in that brain areas and then we say oh that brain areas is the brain areas of right wingness because we need to think about the specificity of that response and this kind of reverse inference is exactly what people have been doing for example in those examples in clinical neurology about pain and um, and treatment so I know that if I give my laser stimulus to someone, that produces pain and, we should say, many other things. I see activity in those areas which have been mislabeled as the pain matrix. But then when I observe activity in those areas, we tend to say, oh, I see that activity because that person is experiencing pain. And therefore, the logical step, the next one, is when I see activity uh, in those areas, in someone who's socially rejected, I say, or is because that person is feeling pain. And obviously, uh, it is possible that these reverse inferences are correct. We have to do them, but we need to reason in a probabilistic way. And the likelihood that this uh, conclusion is uh, wrong, for example, really depends on the response selectivity of the region. If the region or the response we have is not very selective, is not a signature, then we can't say much when we observe that response. And if you think about the brain areas activating in pain or that big vertex potential, then we see that it's produced by many, many types of stimuli. Of course, the activity in the brain is not exactly the same, but the largest part of the activity, the one we are using to understand how the brain works, is um, largely similar. And as a matter of fact, if you put together many, many functional MRI studies, you see that those areas activating, activated when I give a, a stimulus perceived as painful, like the insula, a part of the brain, or the cingulate cortex, the one we saw in the first paper, they are the most activated regions ever in studies of uh, gambling, negative affect, and so on. So it's very difficult from this to draw conclusion without using uh, other uh, experimental approaches. And this idea of um, social and physical pain um, has been fueled by these problems and also by the problem of the vagueness of language, of which I want to spend uh, a minute citing uh, Richard von Mises, who's a fantastic philosopher who I admit I only recently discovered. And he basically says only the replacement of the vague expression of everyday language by more precise ones makes it possible to attack the problem of unambiguous description, which is the first task of language and then the task of science. So what we should aim to is to have really one-to-one -one mapping between terms we are using and their meaning. Um, and the lack of such precision in the examples I gave is really been a source of excitement maybe, but also a source of confusion, for example, when discussing this physical uh, base. And, um, and in, um, in some fields of like uh, neuroscience, this idea of uh, open concepts that change across time, drift of meaning, um, makes many psychological theories very difficult, especially when derived from brain imaging studies, very difficult to test and falsify from a Popperian point of view. And there is a wonderful, <laughs> funny quote from uh, uh, the eminent psychologist, Paul Meal, who said that this vagueness of language is why um, um, psychological theories don't have much progress. They basically, they, they're not falsified, they're not deemed to be right or wrong, they basically uh, are like uh, General MacArthur's old soldiers. They just don't die, they just slowly fade away and they're left in this uh, impossibility of being uh, uh, scientifically assessed. Okay, um, in the last few minutes I want to show uh, this new direction, starting from these ideas, from this lack of specificity. I think there is a very important question here. The important question is, what is it 
than this big, for example, vertex electrical brain response, this massive response that we get, yes, with, uh, when, when we give a stimulus which is painful, but also when we give a stimulus which is not painful, but surprising. We are, we are starting to learn things about this. We know, for example, the rules that the brain uses to decide that it's worthwhile to create that massive thalamocortical uh, synchronization. By a series of experiments with these like trains of little stimuli, identical stimuli, for example, by changing the features of the stimulus one by one, for example, what the stimulus is, or how intense the stimulus is, if you use like a stimuli of different intensities, we were able to divide, to find a kind of hierarchical set of rules that the brain uses, that is that innate knowledge of the world, which I mentioned at the beginning, to decide what is relevant, what is salient in the environment, and what we need to react to. So there is the importance of the feature with the quality, what it is, the intensity of the stimulus, but with some very interesting rules. I don't have time to uh, explain that, but for example, the brains are tuned to detect increases of sensory energy as opposed to decreases of sensory energies. In space, when stimuli change position in space, it's very important where they are, and that relates to the concept of a peripersonal space that uh, Gretti was mentioning at the beginning. For example, if we give stimuli uh, in trains um, which move from the right hand to the left hand, we see that, surprisingly, the brain is not recognizing that change of location in a, as something very important. When you start increasing the somatotopic distance between hand and foot, and you contrast stimuli on the hand when they're preceded by stimuli on the same hand or on the opposite foot, you see that we start getting what we call a dishabituation. So the brain bothers producing that response. But if you do the same kind of comparison, and you ask your subject not to stay like this, but for example, to put the hand and the foot close to each other in external space, which is a nice way to dissecting and dissociating distance on the map of the body and distance in egocentric coordinates, you see that that um, ability to decide that the stimulus is relevant is gone. Well, not the ability, the, the brain decides that the stimulus is not, the change of stimulus is not as relevant as it was when they were far apart in space, which again, I think, gives, um, I think, a bit of support to the idea that we bother producing that response only when there is something which is new in the environment and we need to act on it. Uh, so the idea is that this large brain activity is very important for detecting, deciding what is relevant, and reacting to events which are significant happening on the body. And um, the famous Descartes drawing of the nociceptive system, um, I'm not going to spend time also because Daniel Garber is here, he's a big fan of uh, Descartes, he would be upset, but he got it completely wrong in terms of mechanisms. Um, he thought there was like uh, some compressed air coming out of the brain going into pipes, into the nerves. But the point is, he said something very important. We have this nociceptive stimulus needs to be recognized. And the point I'm making is that we want to have in the brain a system which is able to identify the stimulus as a something potentially dangerous, even before it's painful, even before it touches the body, and be able to react to it. So a viable, I think, hypothesis is that that activity is somehow related to action. And we know that perception and action in the brain are uh, extremely close. Um, if Alain Berthoz was here, would say um, that he coined this um, uh, new word, which is perception, the fusion of perception and uh, action. Um, so it's very interesting to understand what this thing is. Um, what is an evoked potential? What is it? What does it do? Um, it was described in France, actually, by Banco for the first time, showing that you can uh, use different kinds of stimuli to produce the same response. Um, we have shown this very clearly. You can get virtually the same response with stimuli which are visual, auditory, uh, tactile, and noxious, perceived as painful. Again, with, with electrophysiology, it's a bit easier to distinguish things because you can play with the latency of peripheral um, the differences in latency due to peripheral conduction. But the point is that all these stimuli produce the response. 
And therefore, um, I'm going to conclude with an experiment which we've done recently, which I think is a very simple thing, but is uh, going a bit towards the idea of what these responses are. It's a simple experiment in which we ask uh, subjects to um, hold a transducer of force, pressing a transducer with the force that you would need to keep your phone in your hand. And then we give to those subjects those stimuli, auditory or um, electric shock, which we know very well produce that big vertex potential, which is our uh, unknown, what we want to understand. Um, and we give both uh, auditory and somatosensory stimuli. And what you see is that in the force applied by the subject, the subject has to do nothing but maintaining the same force. He's not giving any feedback, only at the beginning of um, of the experiment is asked to squeeze more or less to get about one newton of force and discard the stimuli which are arriving, which are these electric shock or auditory stimuli. And here we found that if you plot the force, the difference of force across time, you see that both somatosensory and auditory stimuli, both shocks and bangs, produce a very complicated pattern of activity of variation of force. If we enlarge this, there is a first release of force followed by an increase of force, then there is maybe a second release and then a long-lasting increase of force which lasts up to seconds. The subject doesn't notice this. It's a small thing. We're talking about 1-2% um, with respect to the initial force applied. This is a bit of stats to show how consistent this response is uh, across individuals. Um, and then, if you look at the brain activity, it's almost too tempting to say that this decrease, increase, this pattern of force happens at the same time than the big, large, vertex, thalamocortical wave. And so you really want to understand how the two things are related because you, you start thinking maybe that brain activity is what is making the, uh, the force. And here it's a bit of a complicated slide, but I would, like you to, I would like to show you, I'll try to explain it. If you try to relate the activity of the brain, which you're measuring with electrodes, and this force, if you want this motor response, you can do it within a subject asking whether when a response in the brain is very big, also the variability of the force is very big. And therefore, here we do a correlation between brain activity across time and this force modulation across time. And here is a value of correlation. What you see is that the amplitude of the vertex wave is predictive of not of the first release, but of the first increase and of the long subsequent increase. So if you have a big vertex wave, then you have a bigger modulation of force, which will last also after the response. Here is 400 milliseconds, here is 400 milliseconds, here is later. And surprisingly, you can also ask whether this happens across subjects, like those of you who have a bigger vertex wave, whether they have also bigger variations of uh, force, bigger effects on the motor system. And again, it's very rare to find this between participant correlation with behavior. This is one of the few times I found this. And basically, the amplitude, at least of the first part, the negative wave of the big vertex potential, seems to be predictive of how much the person will have that modulation of, um, of uh, um, squeeze on the transducer. And obviously, that becomes a bit technical. I'm sorry. This is the response in the brain that you recover from a single electrode. But what you can do, you can look at how these correlations are distributed across the scalp. And if you remember that this response, this vertex wave, is absolutely symmetrical, is maximal at the center of the head, then it's interesting to observe that these correlations, A, B, and C, a and B, the correlation between the later vertex wave and the increase of force, is not symmetrical. It's stronger on the same side of the hand receiving the shock or the auditory stimulus, and the hand is contralateral to the hand holding the transducer. While the other one, the one happening early, 
is a correlation which is maximal on electrodes which are on the other hemisphere, the hemisphere contralateral to the hand receiving the shock or receiving the auditory stimulus. And I think this is interesting because it shows that what we are dealing with here is not just the wave itself, but this big thalamocortical activity which the brain produces only when there is a reason for, has an impact on the systems, the corticospinal, the orders that the brain gives to muscles in order, for example, to hold your transducer and to do your motor task. And something else we could not avoid to do is to replicate that experiment with the three stimuli, um, which are repeated. In this case, they were auditory stimuli, but it could be electrical shock. And you see that the stimuli produce a response which is reduced because the stimulus is, becomes a predictable event in the environment. The brain decides that it's not worthwhile to use all that energy to produce the big vertex wave. And then the question is, is the effect on the motor system also following what the brain does or is just reflecting what the sensory input is, which is constant in S1, S2 and S3, the three stimuli of the triplet. And it's quite clear that it follows what the brain does. Again, this is correlation. Uh, we need to see how solid that is, but certainly is a strong uh, suggestion that uh, this big vertex wave does have a function, and the function is something um, motor, has an effect on the motor system. So these responses, traditionally, they've been interpreted within the sensory domain. Uh, they've been in the realm of sensory physiology, but it seems that there is a basic physiological mechanism that couples these responses with the motor output, and that motor output is modulated in a complex way. Um, these are not just reflexes, they are strongly dependent on the factors which, um, like the context in which the stimuli are delivered. But the point is, I think this is a nice example of link between perception and action. So these environmental stimuli have an immediate effect on motor activity, and it's certainly tempting to say that this is probably possibly important to prepare actions which are important either to defend yourself, to survive, or to um, exploit an affordance in the world, like to catch a prey. So like predator or a prey. So let me jump up to um, the summary slide I have, which are important. I think Starting from the beginning, I showed how most of the problems in the field of like uh, pain or imaging arose from vague use of language and the neglect of some very important activities that the human, human brain does when there is a stimulus which is behaviorally relevant. Something which is perceived as painful is also very able to capture attention. Oops to increase autonomic responses and to have motor responses. And as much as this painful quality of the percept is specific for the pathway I'm activating, if I give to the subject an equally salient, intense auditory stimulus or an electric shock or a visual flash of light, I still get this kind of responses. Neural activity related, for example, to motor responses, which are very important to survive and to achieve uh, that um, ultimate duty of human beings, of beings, living beings, which is to replicate and reproduce themselves. So things I hope you will remember after this um, presentation is that brains have evolved in those organisms that move very much in the environment, animals, those belonging to the animal kingdom, to cope with the world through perception and through, option, and through action. We perceive the world through narrow, species-specific windows, which are largely innate. They've been shaped across generations by natural selection in order to ensure this important aim of life, which is survival and reprodu reproduction. 
We've seen how these salient and unexpected stimuli, which occur either on the body or close to the body, elicit responses which are very different in their nature. And those are the ones we have seen. We can detect with MRI or with electrical activity, or if we measure electrical activity of the brain as a big vertex biphasic wave. And we've seen how only a small part of this response, a tiny part of that brain activity, is related to the quality of the percept while the large dominating part of the brain response reflects activity which we call supramodal or amodal, which are independent of the quality of the stimulus. And that implies that the overlap with responses which are caused, for example, by painful stimuli or by auditory stimuli is not enough or sufficient to make claims about, for example, a patient in coma feeling pain or to say much about the neural mechanisms behind a social interaction. Those are examples of incorrect reverse inferences, reverse inferences that we have to do, but we have to be extremely careful when we make them because um, we have a tendency of associating factors even when they're not associated. So the important thing is that this electrical activity in the brain is the largest synchronization of neural activity that we can record from the brain of a person healthy without epilepsy and awake. In sleep, there are things which are even bigger, which I find very interesting. There are two fields which we haven't really talked to each other. The K complexes are very similar to these vertex waves and they're as big. Um, we have seen that we are trying to understand the models that cause, determine the occurrence of these responses models that the brain uses to decide whether it's worthwhile to produce that, and they rely very much on the behavioral relevance of the stimulus. For example, its position and how the stimulus moves with respect to where we are. Still, we can't say much, we should be very cautious. We don't know what these responses are, what they do. We must ask ourselves, as always in biology when we have a phenomenon, what is it for? What is it useful for? What it was maybe useful for? But certainly there is now a hypothesis, and we have some preliminary evidence, that these responses seem to have an impact on the motor system, which is probably related to the defense, and here I think I should really add the exploitation of affordances uh, in the world. Um, and this is something I didn't have time to show, which is another part of our research, showing that even reflexes, responses which happen through subcortical circuits, like withdrawal reflexes, or the eye closure, the blink reflex, when you get uh, a stimulus on your face, they are also modulated by the cortex as a function of those same factors which govern the production of this big response, the behavioral relevance of the stimuli. And I think the last slide which I have is the really the most important one, which is the slide of people um, who have been working on all these uh, things and um, uh, they really are behind all the work I showed and I think they should be thanked uh, much more than me. Thank you very much.